Welcome back. Thank you for coming back. Okay, what we want to do is, on top of this incredibly uninteresting uh, kind of just wall structure that we put together here, go through and actually start adding some of the other elements. We want to start adding doors and windows and ultimately a floor and a roof in this thing. And we can actually get through a lot of that. In terms of working with these other elements, the doors and the windows, the important thing to note about them right off is that you sort of create them in a very different way, as opposed to sketching some geometry and having it create based on some system family thicknesses and assumptions about the wall type. These are things we actually just go pulling out of the library, we pull out of the catalog somewhere, and go get some standard sizes that are already loaded in there, and that's going to be good. If we need a size that isn't one of the standard sizes, we can um, make duplicates and change some parameters to create the sizes we need. So when it comes to component families, the game is find something in the library which is pretty close to what you want, then bring it on in, and then if we need to adapt it, we start changing parameters to see if we can resize it or just kind of change its shape. And within that, like there's gonna be a lot of cool things that are available within the Revit libraries already. But we can change those things, we can customize them to kind of make them more like the geometry we need, or we can go out and download things from there's a couple of really good sites. One's called RevitCity.com. It's in the handout. I haven't been following so closely here. But in the handout says that uh, Revit City, um, you can get a link to that, where you can download some downloads. There's also a really good site called seek.autodesk.com, which is kind of like the equivalent of Sweet's catalog. It's where manufacturer parts are put there. Revit City is more a lot of parts that just enthusiasts and students have shared. Um, Seek is where official manufacturer parts get put. But you can search for there and find the perfect house or you can find that plumbing fixture you're looking for. You, know, you don't need to create all these parts from scratch. An awful lot of them are out there and manufacturers are very actively creating parts. So the way the world of parts works is as follows. Let me zoom on out on that one a little bit so you can sort of see that into the world. In the architecture tab, we can look at doors or windows. Let's look at doors first. If you choose the door tool, I should save this project. You should save this project. Don't do it, I, I always just keep on canceling. Yeah. Only say, you know, only keep canceling as long as you're willing to lose to have a mount, you know, work to do that thing. It's not for crashes, so, you know, don't, don't, don't get yourself in this hole where four hours later you lose something. Okay. In terms of placing doors, you'll see there's really quite a few, <laughs> much fewer options. You don't really need to draw the door. There's some types that we can select from, so we can select the types. Right now it says a 36 by 84 inch door, so 36 wide, 84 tall. Single flush, that's like one of those flat panel doors that don't really have any uh, detail to them. Okay, um, there's a place for loading in new families. We'll experiment with that in just a minute. So let's go and place this door. There's some parameters. The sill height for most doors is assumed to be at zero, so that the door goes all the way down to the ground level. And if we choose that door type, we can choose some different types or sizes if we want. But if I choose that size, and kind of into the plan view, you'll see that when you hover over a wall, it'll suggest that it's going to place a door. Now, you'll get this I cannot place here symbol if you're hovering over a part of the model that won't host the element. So doors are an example of a hosted element. They need a wall to go into. They're assumed to go into a wall. So you, you can't just put it out in the middle of space. So I'll put it over a wall. And when I click, notice it's going to show up in, I thought it was going to show up in that view, but I think I'm just sort of reoriented looking at the wrong piece. It shows up in the 3D view as well as in the 2D view. Let's go ahead and place another door in there. I'll put another door in just kind of oh, right in here. This one's going to open to the out. Notice that in the 3D view, doors actually do have a directionality to them. Yeah, they do in the plan view. Also down in here, this is a relatively thick wall. There's some assumption about whether the door panel is on the inside or the outside of that wall. In the floor plan view, if you place the door and it turns out it's just either hinged on the wrong side or flipped to the wrong side, you could always change that. And how you do it is you just choose the door. When you choose the door, kind of like a wall had its little glyph that allowed you to flip it, we can now flip the door to the inside and actually change its uh, or hinging side also. So really whatever you need. If it needs to hinge in the other direction, 
if it needs to flip in whatever it takes and it'll again adapt in all the views accordingly. Okay. So you can move doors around kind of like you can move walls you can just choose that and drag it to wherever you need it to be or type in a specific value like five feet away from the wall wherever it is and things will stay intact. So in general doors are pretty good if it turns out you place the door and you need a different size I don't really want a 36 inch door I need a 32 inch door instead choose it and then in the menu here you can choose a different type so we'll pull on down say 32 by 84 okay, and it'll shrink it a little bit so again place things if they're not quite right we can change the parameters change different types as we do that the model will stay whole and it'll do something that it needs to so door forecast is pretty easy and you can place different types of doors two variations on that thing you need to know about one is as follows. We got these door sizes which look pretty good, 30 inch door, 36 inch door, things like that. You may need another size for whatever your application is. You might want a 24 inch wide door if you have a very small little space that some people will go through and you want to put that in. Or you may need a very big door, a 48 inch wide door or something like that. So if you have another application and you want a type which isn't already in that list, it's really easy to do. What you got to do is as follows. This is again one of the very general purpose things. You'll do this a lot because this is how we're working. You got types. I really want to create a new type that is also similar but a little different. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll choose one of the types, like that 32 inch door, that's fine. But then what I want to do is edit the type. Now, editing the type is kind of an okay thing to do. What you can see is these are the parameters that define it. So it's seven feet tall, and that's width, which was two foot eight. That's worth getting the 32. You can edit the type, but actually editing an existing type is a little bit dangerous because although you want a 24 inch door, if there's some doors that are already placed which are 32 inches wide, you change this dimension they'll all shrink up too, because they're all defined by this type. So what's better to do is actually duplicate this and create a new one. And that's a general principle. So go through and in this dialog, just say duplicate. It'll give you a name. This is again, just sort of something that's to help you identify it in the list. This isn't really computationally active. That's just really just a numeric or actually an alphabetic string to help you identify things. So it's 24 by 84 give it a name so that'll be in the list now we have to sort of say how would the parameters change to define that so this width over here i'll change to two foot zero say okay okay now we got a little two foot door and that two foot door is showing up in the list too so again if i go to doors okay that's in the list so one thing we can do is for any different family, if the family's already in here, it's one of these kind of component families, if you just need to create a new type which is defined by a different set of parameters, do it. Go ahead and download it, or I mean, duplicate it, change the parameters. It's now available for you to work with. Okay. The other variation on this theme that you need to know about is you know, if you don't want single flush doors, if you want doors that have panels or have glass or double doors, you want to load those. Yes. Right. And how can you access, uh, I don't know, like a bar that you just created, whatever you want to do? Is that saved to the program? It actually is. Where it is, it exists in the families right now. So what it is, is down here in families, you'll find doors. And there's actually that size. And if we want to go through and save the store out, we can right click and say save, save it out there, you know, as a family including that type and download it into another one. Or even if you have the two, if you have your old project and new project side by side, there's something called transferring the project standards, just you know, copying them across. So yeah, and that's part of why after after you develop a nice library of all your favorite sizes, you save that as a template so that you don't have to kind of keep on recreating it again and again. And you'll find, like, I do a lot of historical renovation uh, residential work down in San Jose. You know, there's certain things that I use again and again. So I have my own custom template for old wall types and sizes of doors and styles of doors that were sort of period appropriate. 
depending on the style of design you do, go have your own library of these kind of collections of things. Just for, just for the sake of the Okay, so you can save the parts. The other thing you can do, though, is, you know, kind of like what we're going to share them, if you want to load in some doors which aren't already here, for example, here's the doors, single flush, that's okay. If you want to bring in some other door types, what you can do is go to, if with the door tool selected, load family, and go out to Revit's library and take a look at the doors. Now, if you do that and there aren't any doors listed, if the library appears to be empty, you're in the, I need to download the templates and the content situation, and Laddie and Raj are gonna help you with that in terms of like getting the, you know, copy in. You really just need to copy something to your hard disk. But what you do is go to that doors, and oh, I got all sorts of things. I got double glass, I got double glass with some dividers, I got panel doors. If I wanted to put a door like the one in the back of the room here, that is a single glass door. Okay, so single door with glass in the panel in the middle of it. You can load those in if you want to. You can load a couple of them in there. Oops, not that. Windows 8 and I are still learning about each other. Let me load in some of those double doors. Say open. Okay, and now magically my door palette, my type selector really has a lot more choices in it. Double glass, single glass. So if I want to put in one of those single glass doors, I can grab that. I'll come over here in 3D and drop it in there right next to that one. Put another one in here. So I can put all the doors in I want to. You just kind of drop them in there. In the same sense, if you want to get like the double glass door, choose one of those sizes. We'll put some of those back into this wall. Again, inside or outside, you can decide which way you want it to hinge. And back over here, let me just uh, zoom to fit, and I'll come back around the door the other way. So that's the gist of doors. And really, for most of the system families, it's pretty much you're grabbing things from libraries, you're changing the parameters if you need to, you're loading in different libraries. And again, if you don't have what you need, you go to Revit City or you go to seek.rs.com, pull all that stuff in. And you really, you know, I'll share with you, I got a library full of the last 10 years of my favorite parts. And I use this. Yeah, you just collect these things and share them. And, you know, good parts, is, it's, it really helps you. Okay, if you can handle doors, okay, you got windows. Because doors and windows really, they work just about the same way. D windows, on the one hand, they're simpler because you don't have to worry about this whole inside of what they're, where they're hinged. They sort of have an inside and an outside. It's a little harder from the standpoint that, oh, you have to worry about sort of the, the height. You know, doors tend to be located together, it's still height zero, though you can change that, you can raise them up a little bit. Windows, you have this notion of a head height or a sill height. And let's show you how they work. So windows, go to the window tool. They have some nice fixed height windows in here. Or fixed windows, excuse me. Just uh, They don't operate. So 48 inch tall is fine. Let me go ahead and I'll put some of those into my little structure. As you're placing things, I should let you know, there's a notion of if you can see the way my mouse is positioned, I'm actually sort of towards the outside of the wall. Yeah, as you're placing them, you can get to when you click towards the outside, the window will be in the right direction. That's just kind of like you know, they have the directionality to it. If you're inside or outside, and vice versa, there's a, a glyph again, you can flip them around. Okay. So the, there is a notion about which side they open to. So I can click here, I can click there. Now we'll learn when we start doing this on Monday or Tuesday. Again, people, I want to come Monday for some reason. It'll be very lonely in here. Okay, uh, as you place these things, we can copy them, we can mirror them. If there's any sort of a drafting technique that you're familiar with, offsetting them, we can do all those things in terms of placing them quickly. But the unique thing about windows you have to know as you go placing them is they have this notion of they have a sill height and a head height. We'll talk about that for just a second. So I got this 48-inch tall window, and I can look at how it's defined to get 48 inches. 
as I'm placing them, okay, it puts them in a sort of a default fill height, and that's what we see set at three feet tall, the head is 20 feet. I go placing some more windows in there. The way we tend to place windows, at least used to place them, in sort of very conventional construction or design, we tend to place them some of the, the head heights about the same. Typically, the head height of the window and the head height of the door will be all the same. You know, it's kind of a funny rule, but it, it works pretty well for kind of making these look fairly consistent. So we tend to place them based on the head height. You can also place them based on the fill height. These two things are related in this way. You can really choose either of those. What's going to be held constant is the 48 inches. It's the 48 inch part. Okay, if you put the, the sill at two feet, the head will be at six. If you put the sill at four, the head will be at eight. So it doesn't really matter whether I sort of specify the top or if I specify the bottom, whichever way you do it, okay, those two things are going to move together with each other. Okay, because the window itself is four feet tall. Okay. So you can again choose a window. And if you want to put a different size in there, choose a different size. If that size isn't quite right, and I need a four foot window as opposed to a four foot wide window as opposed to a three foot wide window, I can edit the type and duplicate it. And I'll make a 48 inch by, oh, 84 inch. I'll make a big old window. And I put in the parameters. It's seven feet tall or 84, whichever way you want to think about that. It can either be 40 or 048. Again, either way will work. Okay, and we get that new size. So, you know, that all works just exactly the same way doors does. In the same sense, if you want to load in a different one, for example, I want to get a new window type, I'll go to the window tool. I'll say load and go out to the windows, and you'll see there's all sorts of groovy windows out there available for you too little arch tops, awning windows, casement windows that are double or single, elliptical windows, all sorts of stuff. I'm just going to bring that little arch top in because you'll see it really easily. Okay, and please pardon my architectural design over here. I can go ahead and place these guys in. And again, if I want to change the size, I can choose it. make it much bigger, whatever it is. Okay, so hopefully you're getting the idea that I'm really trying to interact with the building models and other buildings and bringing in different elements. And I don't know if we've been paying very much attention to all of what's going on in the floor plan and use of the elevation beam. That's all being taken care of automatically for you. That's just kind of happening in the background. I want you to really think about it in terms of the building you're modeling, not the drafting technique and the document. Okay. Two last things we're going to give you today that you can kind of practice on over the weekend. One is the notion of how to put a floor under something, the other is how to put a roof on top of something. And it turns out those two things are really incredibly closely related. Because if you think about it, floors and roofs aren't all that different from each other. You know, like a flat roof is an awful lot like a floor that has tar and gravel on the top. There's really not a whole lot of difference. Okay. Floors and roofs, it turns out, aren't defined as components. You can't just pull a roof out of the catalog and make it fit. You have to actually sort of specify a geometry and then generate the roof to fit that geometry. And how are we going to do it? Unlike walls, where you just sort of specify a single line, for a roof or a floor, you specify a boundary. And it'll sort of generate a floor or a roof that fits that boundary. So let's show you how that works. And to do that, what I'll do is I'm going to close up. Let me just, I'm going to expand my floor plan so you can sort of see that better. So here's the deal. We're going to go ahead and create a floor. As I'm creating a floor, I'm going to put it on level one. So I can switch to the level one floor plan view. Make sure I'm looking there. I'm going to choose the floor tool. There's a couple of different choices in there, but floor architectural work for what we're doing here. Okay. This is going to be sort of like it was in walls, where we can draw some different things in terms of the boundary in different ways. We can choose a type. There's the generic 12-inch floor, which doesn't have any sort of specific material. There is a lightweight concrete. There's a tile floor, a carpet floor, a wood finished floor. Again, these can all be customized. So if your floor needs to be a little bit different, has different sizes, joists, a different types of finished materials, you can change all that. Either now by creating a new type or after the fact. But it really comes down to drawing a boundary. Let's talk about that. 
you can draw a boundary. For example, I could go ahead and grab the line tool and just draw some boundary. Okay, and that will create a floor. I can do with a rectangle if I want to do that. You can make another little floor kind of hang around in here. Okay, but the way I'm going to recommend you drawing your floors, if you can, to actually give you a little more kind of uh, just ultimate you know, parameterization and uh, making the model a little bit stronger, is as opposed to just drawing walls along a line, to use this little tool. It's called the pick wall tool. And you can see a little kind of green section and an arrow pointing at it. That says what I want to do is to both just drawing it into an arbitrary place, which may happen to line up with something, you know, pick that wall and actually use that wall as the thing to lock it to. It's kind of like walking the top of walls to a floor level, locking a floor to a wall line, which is really what it's all about. What I can do is choose that little pick tool, and then I can come over to the model and pick the wall. And I can pick that wall. And I can go ahead and pick all these walls. Now, even when you're picking, there's this whole sort of notion, should I be sort of the inside of the wall or the outside of the wall? And generally, it makes sense to sort of bring them to the outside of the core of the walls. If you kind of think about frame construction, if you know about frame construction, actually, it's, it's this sort of condition here. You don't want it to be the outside of the wall. You want it to be the outside of the core, okay, typically. But again, we'll talk about that more when we sort of do this in more detail. So I'm going to leave them flipped sit to the outside. What I got to do is ultimately just get a complete boundary. Okay, so that is a complete boundary. When I say complete boundary, what it can do is kind of like make a nice loop. What it can't do is it can't do that. It can't sort of overlap. Hang out. If I try to finish now. It'll give me a little warning. No, it has to be a closed loop. There seems to be a problem on this end. And I'll say, okay, we'll try again. I can bring that back. I can use the trim tool to bring that back, or I can just sort of slide it back. I also can't do that. Okay. It won't like that because it's not a complete loop. If you're having trouble making things match, there's this great little trim tool that we'll learn some more about where we can sort of grab two different lines and bring them together. But if you pick your walls, generally they'll do a pretty good job of closing that loop. And when you say finish, you hopefully you're going to get something like that that looks like a floor. Okay, so if you're following along, let's see if you can kind of get a floor. The floor is in there in 2D. The floor is in here in 3D. I can always choose the floor. Right now it's a wood frame floor. I can change its type. I want to make it a carpet floor or something like that. I can change those things. And once you've defined that boundary, it'll just kind of keep on regenerating the floor with a type to whatever you need. Let's see if you get a floor in there. Yes. Oh. Okay, let's take a look at your boundary lines. If we choose one of the pink boundary lines, it should go ahead and have like a little flipper. Let's see if you can see it. Uh, oh, and then, uh, so that's the inside. What's happening on some walls, the very thick walls, which have the uh, kind of compound construction, it's actually taking it to the outside of the core. Uh, so it's not, yeah, so it's still, it's like the outside of the brick or the outside of the steel setting without actually, you know, as far as you can get it. But it's actually in the right place. Oh. What it'll do is, you know, when we're defining the wall, we specify which layers are considered core layers and which are considered finished layers. And then it's just picking up that information. So, you know, when we place the wall, or when we place the floor, it'll always hug up to. This issue of, uh, let me do it here, edit it again. When we go placing it, you have this choice of whether we should hug to the core, it's right here, or just go to the outer surface. But it ultimately it's controlled by, in the wall, how we define where the core boundary is. It, it almost, yeah, it's almost always you'll hook to the core as opposed to the outer surface. Okay. And the reason is, if you think about how we're going to be constructed over here, 
if this is a multi-story structure, so you kind of want the floor to come right to the edge of the structure. The finish will probably wrap all the way up and down the entire building and hide the floor from you. So a real common mistake that we make at first is, you know, people will do a multi-story structure and you'll see all the floors kind of hanging out to the edges. And what that is all about is it's going to show you you push it back to the core so the material can wrap the outside. Okay, so, yeah, file that one away. It'll, it'll come in handy later. You know, when your, your floors are kind of hanging out too far, you can kind of see them. It, it's this issue of really where the boundary is defined, the core or not. Then it'll assume by default to take it to the core and fits in with a smarter assumption. Okay, so if you have a floor, you're doing good. You are so, so close to having a roof because the floor and the roof are really very similar. Let's talk about that. Okay. Floors, we just defined a single boundary around the outside. We'll learn more about how to kind of cut holes and do things like that. Roofs, we're going to do it a very similar way. The big difference when you know about roofs is they're not at level one. They tend to be up at level two or some higher level. It's OK if you draw your roof at level one. It'll kind of complain at you, but we can move it up to level two later. It's just an option. So, but to get yourself started, you're probably better off going to level two. So I'll go to level two. Let me bring that window up. Hopefully in level two, you can see your structure. It should be hanging around there. It might be grayed out because it's kind of below level two. Okay, but hopefully you'll still see the structure hanging around there. You can adjust that if you can. We're going to go to the roof tool. And in the roof tool, go through and choose roof by footprint. We have a lot of ways of choosing roofs depending on the geometry, but footprint will let us do kind of a gable roof or a hip roof, something like that. You'll notice, hey, these tools look kind of familiar in terms of what's going on. This whole notion of picking walls, okay, I got that. I learned that when I had to do the floors. That's kind of okay. The differences that you need to know about is one is the notion of overhanging because when we place roofs on, we tend not to stop right on the wall, we tend to overhang a little bit so that we're shielding ourselves from the sun and the rain and keeping things off the wall surface. The other thing you need to know about is the little checkbox here that says define slope. And as we define the different walls, we can choose which ones actually are sloping up from that wall surface and which ones are vertical. Okay. And let's just start by creating something that slopes up from all sides. That'll be what we call a hip roof. So I'll choose the wall tool. Let me give it a little overhang. Let me say about two feet. Now, as we work, Okay, you know, I could even say extend that into the wall core. That would be measuring it from the face of the studs. I can click on walls. Notice when I'm hovering over a wall, I get the choice of the inside or the outside. I'm going to leave it on the outside. So it'll overhang there. Click those all around. And again, I'm trying for a complete boundary. I want a complete loop all the way around there. In this case, it'll kind of slope up from all sides. Okay. It's a generic roof right now. We could go ahead and change that type, either before or after. Say a wood rafter roof. Say, let's finish it. And with any luck, you should get something that kind of looks like this. Okay, so I got a roof, I got a floor, I got a wall. I will declare a victory on actually having some little enclosed structure. It's not a very pretty enclosed structure, but it's some sort of little enclosed structure. Let's say we get a roof on yours. And as we're waiting for that, I should show you, well, now let's leave it at that. We'll, we'll play around more with roofs out of respect for time later. Okay. The nice thing about doing this by picking walls, what we've done with our little drawing here, our little building here, is we actually have a, a structure which is all hanging together. So for example, if I go through and choose one of these walls and move the wall, watch what happens. The roof stretches, the floor stretches, everything stretches and stays in sync with each other. If I change the levels, if I go pushing things in, the nice thing is the structure is actually fairly smart about what it's doing, and we like that. That makes it a whole lot easier to revise things if we need to. And that's just sort of a well-constructed little model. So let me just show you, not when you follow along, but in the last few minutes, let me just show you what you would actually do with this. So you can play with this over the weekend if you want to. 
We've been constructing this thing oh, sometimes in the floor plan view, sometimes in the 3D view, but we've been kind of popping around in different views, whatever seems to be the easiest to kind of generate the geometry with. And as we've been working, I haven't really been paying very much attention to the different views, but level one is the floor plan, level two, or the 3D view, we've been sort of popping in and out. There's all these little elevations, they've actually been drawing all along too. So we have kind of a lot of different views of the model. So what do you do if you actually want to share this with someone? Because it's great that we're doing a 3D model and give someone the 3D model. If I want to sort of create this traditional drafting view and share it, we need to have a way to do that. And let me show you how it looks. Under the view tab, there's actually something called a sheet. We create a new sheet. And again, we'll do this in detail next time. A, sh a sheet is really just a placeholder for putting different views on. So with that sheet, we can basically drag any of the different views onto the sheet that we want to. <laughs> so let me go back over to level one for a second. Now level one actually has a lot of stuff on it right now. Some of the stuff's inside, some of the stuff's outside. One thing when you're dragging to sheets that you have to pay attention to is what the scale is. Another is this notion of cropping. So you want to just crop to only show the things that you want to show. A lot of times your model will have other stuff that you don't really want to include. You just want to crop it out. So how that works is I can do something called showing the crop region. And then I can sort of take that region and sort of pull it in. And really just get that down to where you want it to be. So that's the building I want to show. And I can raise its scale if I want to to quarter scale make it a little bit bigger on the sheet. But you basically just kind of crop views to make them fit. Okay, let me go back to the sheet. Once you have a view, you can just drag it in and put it on the sheet. And there's my floor plan. Okay. In a similar sort of way, the elevations can all kind of come over to the sheet too. You could typically go through and crop them or colorize them or whatever you want to do. But if I want to get the elevation on there, there's the elevation. Let me go to the sheet. Yes? Sure. We'll do it to actually do one of these elevations because I don't like everything that I'm looking at there. Oh, for creating the sheet or cropping the view to fit on the sheet? Okay. So let's, for example, we'll go to the south elevation. There's more stuff here that I don't want to see. I just want to focus on this building. I don't want to include this one. Okay. What we do is down here in the bottom, there's a couple of different little controls. There's one that looks like a little light bulb. It's like a crop symbol with a light bulb. That'll show the crop region. And then what we do is choose that and just drag the boundaries in. And that way we can get it all focused on just the region you want. Same thing, let me do the west elevation. I'll choose it. And if this is the building I want, I'll show the crop region. And I'll drag them in. Okay, once we have that, we can go back to the sheet and just drag in the cropped view. And I'll put the south elevation up here. I'll put the west elevation in here. But it's really going to be, I have all these camera views. It's just dragging them into the sheets. The nice thing is, it's going to take care of itself. And the cool thing is now, oh, for example, you know, we have this roof. All these elements are in here. It's all looking pretty good. Let me go back to the elevations, or I can even just activate it here, but let me go to the elevations. Oh, actually, I just activate it. I can do something like choose that roof, and if it turns out that slope's a little bit tall, I don't want it 912, I want it to be more like 512, more common for here in California. I could say apply and watch. As I'm doing that, all the different views are updating themselves. They'll all grow, they'll all shrink. So it really is just a live model underneath there. And we can stop worrying about the drafting to make sure those all things, all those things take, stay consistent. Let me deactivate that view. Other views you can put in here. I can take that 3D view and put that on here if I want to include that as part of my design. Or if I want to put more of a perspective view on here, this is another one that's really easy to generate. I'll say level, I'll grab a camera, I'll put a camera out here and just sort of drag it so it's facing the building. There's kind of my, looks like I'm inside the other building. That wasn't a very good spot. 
Let's come back out here again. That was weird. Camera over here facing that building right there. There we go. That's a little better looking. Let me crop that again so I can uh, not see it. So here's the 3D view I just created, 3D view 2. I'll go back to the sheet and I can just drag that on. So what I hope you're, you know, in this last couple minutes is becoming clear to you is that all the work goes into sort of creating a good model, just really getting a good 3D model of what's going on. If you get a good 3D model, constructing all the different views, getting them on the sheet, that's actually pretty easy. So really where the interesting effort goes is creating the model, making that right, and then choosing our views carefully and deciding what's the man sheet in, what kind of text to put it in, but somehow you know, we want to tell a story here. This story may not be so easy to interpret. It needs a little more uh, guidance to help you understand what my text <coughs> is. But theoretically, the work's going into the modeling and the crafting of the story, not the drafting and production of it. Okay? That's the highlight. So between now and next Tuesday, if you can, to get it up, yeah, A, get things loaded on your computer if you can. Let's see if we can get that all story away. And B, just sort of play around. Let's see if you can you know, create your own little building and play with doors and windows and drag some views on there so you can get the hang of the cropping and how that works and stuff with some of the options. Just get sort of fluid with that. Next month, Tuesday, we'll give you sort of the first assignment. We'll be creating a little building. We'll give you a program for building and you'll be kind of creating a model for it. And we'll start just going through the elements in more detail. We'll start with walls and doors and windows and more of the nuance <coughs> to really kind of understand how you control those things more finally. And we'll start building up here so you get more and more fluid with it. But yeah, really pretty much this is the gist of it right there. So uh, I hope that's enough to kind of get you kick started. Hey, okay. yes? How do you scale the sheet? Oh, the sheet or the view on the, on view the, on the sheet? Okay. Every view has a scale. So how that works is, for example, in these like, oh, in the elevations or something, there's a scale listed right down there in the corner. And the funny thing about scale is when you're looking at the computer, you can't really tell the scale because it's kind of scale independent. But when you put it relative to the sheet, it'll be bigger or smaller. So another way to see that is let me go to the sheet and I'll take a look at this. This is like my little plan view. I'll activate it at which point I can see the scale. So I can then change it to half scale, which will make it huge, or eighth scale, which will make it very small, whatever it is. You can adjust that after the fact. The model doesn't really change. It's just really how do you want to represent that on a piece of paper. And if you need two different scales, what we're going to do is take that view and just duplicate it, have one at scale one and scale one at scale two, and have them both hang around. Because we can really, we can create a thousand different views on the same model, whatever it is we need to tell the story. Yes? Um, can you crop and view yes. with the sheet? Uh, is it still, it's still possible to do it? Yes. Like yes. Okay. If you, it's the cropping. <laughs> so that's the crop view. It's just this little button down here in the view controls. Do not crop it or crop it. So let me zoom on out so you can actually see that. Oop. I'm ZO, zooming out, ZO, just so you sort of know what my fingers are up to. That's uncropped, that's cropped. So again, if you want to keep two different copies, one that's cropped, one that isn't, because you know the one that's cropped is all looking pretty for the sheet, and the one that's uncropped I need to sort of really understand everything. Okay, I'm going to duplicate this. So now I'm going to have the, I'll rename it. And then I'll, I'll just call it the sheet view. Where the sheet view I'll go through and crop. Okay, whereas this one I can uncrop, whatever it is. But you, know, you, you basically, uh, you learn to sort of keep several different views around and put the, the finished one on the sheet. Because of actually, on the sheet one, you know, maybe I want to go ahead and make that all colored in realistic colors or whatever it is that I want to do. That's okay. It can be separate from the working one. OK? 
Okay, so you can just duplicate cameras as much as you need. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, I kind of have another question about oh, okay. scales. I, mean, I remember with AutoCAD, that, well, I personally had issues with scales because you had to scale it in one view and then transfer it to the other yeah. view. So in here, when you select the scale on the sh on the printable sheet, that's the actual scale that it's going to come out of. You don't have to mess with it on different views. Correct. What happens is, the way in AutoCAD's language, each of these different things can be a viewport. Okay. Okay, uh, in, in uh, yeah, in paper space, you can all be different viewports, and each one can have its own scale. Okay. So when you adjust it on the sheet, you're basically changing in that viewport. So whether I come to it here or I look on the sheet, everywhere that has that same one will have the same scale. Okay. But the model is really independent of that. So if you want to have two different viewports with different scales, it's duplicated. Like for example, same way. You know, here's level one, I'll leave it at eight scale. The sheet view, I'll change it and make it quarter scale. So, you know, whenever I place the sheet view, that'll always show up as quarter scale. Whenever I place the other one, it'll show up at eight scale. So, you know, everything about the view will stay true to however it's uh, appearing there. The shading, the lines, the weights, the styles, all that stuff. Okay? No worries, play with it. It's actually, yeah, exactly. They actually sort of fixed the problem that you know, you're, you're, that you're addressing because yeah, that used to be really confusing. Okay, let us go ahead and break for the night.